everyone, my name is Chelsea. Welcome to Little Mountain Ranch. Welcome to my kitchen. I'm really happy to have you here with me today. I have a whole bunch of projects that we're gonna be doing over the next 24 hours and I wanted to take you along with me for all of them. The very first thing that we're doing right now is making some beef broth over on the stove. And I actually have a bunch of bones that have roasted up in the oven over the last three hours. That I'm going to be adding into this other pot on the stove. Actually, I'll probably add some more into the one that I already have going here. And I'm going to be slow cooking that all night long and tomorrow morning we're going to be using that as a base for French onion soup. Last year was the first year that I had canned French onion soup and number one, the French onion soup itself is absolutely delicious just as a French onion soup, but I used it to make gravies, I used it to do pot roasts, um, I used it as a base for beef stew and it's absolutely fantastic and it is really easy to make. The chopping of the onions is very time consuming and then having to fry them all so they get nice and caramelized um, just makes the flavor of the French onion soup so much better so it's definitely worth that step but that is that part of it does take quite a bit of time but outside of that is, is actually a fairly easy thing to do so these bones that we have here I'm just gonna pull them out onto the counter here if you don't have access to uh, your own bones from meat that you're processing yourself this one has a lot of fat on it. Hang on, I just need to pay attention so I don't pour this all over the ground. If you don't have access to your own bones from your own beef, you can call to any around to any of the local butcher, butchers that you have in your area and oftentimes they will have bags of soup bones for a really, really cheap price. And what I do with mine for optimal flavor is I roast my bones for three to four hours, sometimes longer, depending. And then um, once I have roasted them, as you can see here, I put them in big pots like this, and then I slow simmer them for at least eight hours. The longer the better when it comes to bone broth, especially if you're using big knuckle bones, like these ones here, because you want all of that goodness out of the bone marrow and it can take a long time um, simmering those to get all of that out of those big giant bones. So that's what I'm gonna do right now is put all of these bones into these pots. So can you see all this? fat down here that's come off these bones. So I'm not gonna be adding that into my broth. And the reason for that is because whenever you're making bone broth, you actually want to skim off the fat off of it because it can impact the seal on your jar because as everything's kind of boiling up and canning, um, all that fat can boil up and get underneath the lid of your jar and then impact the seal of it. There'll, there'll always be a little bit of fat. You won't get all of it out. But one of the things that you can do to get as much of it out as you can is to put your broth in the fridge overnight and then skim off the solid fats off of the top. However, this fat is fantastic for cooking french fries in. So I'm actually going to be putting this fat into a jar and just putting it in the fridge and then we'll just use it up over the next little bit. You've probably noticed that I have not put my um, french fry cutter that I got at Costco. When was that? About a month ago. So I'm planning on mounting it on the wall right here. And we're actually going to be doing a little bit of a revamp on our kitchen. And we didn't want to put it up there until we were sure what we were going to do here. I want to put a shelf. I used to have a shelf up here that actually fell down and I want to put another shelf up there. So I'm not sure exactly where I'm going to be putting that French fry cutter, but needless to say, once we get that up, we're going to be making poutine and I will use this fat to fry those French fries in. It is absolutely delicious. So as you can see, I can fit quite a few bones in these and then I'm just going to cover them up with water. Like I said, we're just gonna let this cook for about eight hours. These silicone mitts are just fantastic because you can pick up something like this and then just wash this with hot water. It's wonderful. Okay, let's find a jar to put this tallow in. So, we're, oh my goodness, that is heavy. So we'll get this on the stove. This one is already going. We are going to put this fat very, very, very carefully into our jar here. Oh, I 
I'm making a giant mess. That's okay. If you want to get fancy, you can strain out um, all the little meat bits, but I'm not going to worry about that. Just a little bit of added flavor. And we're going to get an entire quart. Yum, that's fantastic. I'm going to add some carrots. I'm going to add some celery tops from all the celery that I harvested. When was that? Yesterday? Yes, it was yesterday. All of that celery has been chopped up and is down in the freeze dryer. One batch is down in the freeze dryer and the rest is in the freezer waiting to go into the freeze dryer. Um, but I have all the celery tops, so I'm gonna throw a whole bunch of those in there. We're gonna put some carrots in there. We won't bother putting any onions in because I'm gonna be adding all the chopped onions that we chop up tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning, we're gonna get up bright and early and head out to the garden. We're going to grab a whole bunch of onions from the greenhouse where I have all my onions curing right now. In my last video, I shared with you the onion harvest, my best onion harvest ever. I am so excited about the onions that I grew this year. So we're gonna go get a whole bunch of those and I'm not quite sure how many quarts this is going to end up making once, once this broth is cooked down and all of that. So I'm not sure how many onions I'm gonna need. However, I'm going to chop up a ton of them because my plan is to freeze dry a whole bunch of onions as well as throw some in the freezer. So if I end up with more than I need for the French onion soup, that's what I plan to do with the rest of it because I'm gonna pl I plan on doing that with a bunch of the onions anyway. Before I sign off for today, I wanted to share with you that my cookbook is now av available for a pre-sale and I will put a link to that down in, my, in the pinned comment and in the show notes below this video. I did my first run of my cookbook back in August and I sold out really quickly, which meant that quite a few of you weren't able to get one. So what we decided to do this time to make sure that as many of you that want one can get one is to do a pre-sale. So we're gonna be running that from now all the way until September 30th, and then we'll be shipping out all of those books in October. We're currently only able to ship in North America. We haven't found a way to do international shipping easily off my website yet, but I do have a digital copy of my cookbook that is always available on my website. And the one thing that's really nice about the digital copy is it does have a clickable index, so it's really easy to navigate around the cookbook. So if you are international, you can still get your hands on one. It's just going to be a digital version and you are more than welcome to print it out on your printer at home and or just get it printed at a local print shop. Thank you so much to each and every one of you who have purchased one of my cookbooks. It has been so fun for me to receive pictures over on Instagram of recipes that you've cooked out of here and just to hear that you've really been enjoying it. So thank you guys so much. So on that note, we are going to sign off for today. We'll be back with you again nice and early in the morning to head out to the garden and then get going on this big canning project. Good morning, my beautiful friends. So my whole plan to start really early this morning was a little bit foiled by a trip that I needed to make to town that I had completely forgotten about. So just got back a little while ago. Up at the house, I have a whole bunch of onions chopped and frying for the French onion soup, but I didn't bring quite as many as I needed from the greenhouse. So we're gonna run down and grab some of those onions. Oh. My goodness, it is so beautiful out here. Coming outside this time of day and then having to go back inside to work again <laughs> is never fun. Darn it. A split cabbage. So these are my winter storage cabbages. And it looks like we're gonna start getting splitting on all of them. So this means we're gonna have to be harvesting cabbages at the absolute latest tomorrow. And it's been getting really cold the last couple of nights, so you can see we're getting some more significant frost damage here. So let's just run over and check on our other squash plants over here and see if we're gonna need to harvest our squash soon too. Yep, it's starting to look like that time. So remember I was saying what I'm waiting for is for frost damage on the top of the plants, but not down in here because my squash that are down in here can actually be damaged by the frost. So once it gets to this point, I am pretty much there as far as needing to harvest. Look at that gorgeous squash down there. 
Got some little delicatas down here. Let's check on our pumpkins up over yonder here. I did get that rotten pumpkin that was over here brought to the turkeys and they were very happy about it. These guys, I feel like I could probably leave for a little bit. So the way it works here on our property is that the low lying areas down here, of course, get much cooler. And during the night, sometimes that cool air rolls up onto the garden. And so the plants that are along the bottom side down over here tend to get hit with the frost first. Then these guys that are up a little bit higher tend to get hit last. And that's boating true this year as well. I'm trying to figure out what the best plan is for this whole situation with the last of the harvesting in the garden. So the cabbage have to come out. Those will have to be picked tomorrow. And I think what I will do is pick the low lying squash tomorrow as well. Get those up on the porch. They'll finish ripening and curing up on the porch. I'll leave the giant pumpkins that are up in the upper part of the garden for a couple more days. We are gonna get frost tonight for sure because it is a clear sky. So even though it's supposed to get into the high 20s today, it will drop down to that freezing level by tonight. I can pretty much guarantee that but I don't think it's gonna get below freezing enough to cause damage to these squash. So I think I can hold off um, on these ones until tomorrow. So I'm taking a little bit of a risk leaving these low-lying squash here, but it's not such a significant risk that I feel, or a risk that I feel under pressure that I need to get them out right now. So I think I'm gonna take that chance, leave them in the ground. We'll harvest all of the squash tomorrow, all of the cabbage tomorrow, and we'll get a final weight on this giant cabbage that I've been waiting to harvest all summer. Oh, yep, definitely are gonna have to pull the cabbage up because this one is splitting too. Darn. Okay, so cabbage, squash, and it also looks like I am going to be able to pick my Brussels sprouts because they're starting to actually open up here on the top. They're nice big size. So I'm gonna pick these and actually hang them in the root cellar. And I'll show you how to do that when we pick them. Uh, and that way we can save them for Thanksgiving and Christmas. I have six plants here, so that should do us for both of those holidays. So we'll pick those, we'll pick the squash, we'll pick the cabbage, and then the giant Dills Atlantic, we will leave for as long as we possibly can. I want them to get as large as possible. Those pumpkins are for my kids for Halloween. And this is the first year that we've had as many develop on them. And I think each of my kids is going to be able to have their own giant pumpkin, which would be so much fun. And then we have our kale here, celery ac over there, and our collard greens over here. So that with the leeks and the large pumpkins will be all that's left in this garden. The only thing that leaves is the potatoes. And we have a plan to go up and pick all of the potatoes and get those into the root cellar. And I'll make sure I, of course, bring you guys along with me for all of that harvesting. A wander down to the garden is not complete without checking out our big, gorgeous sunflower bush here. <laughs> it's just getting more stunning by the second. And who knows, I've been saying that I didn't think we would have time left in the season for these ones that are along the stem here to bloom, but maybe we will because it's supposed to be really, really warm. Isn't that yellow just gorgeous against the blue sky? So incredibly beautiful. So let's go into the greenhouse, which I should probably open up too because it's probably getting pretty warm in there. And grab some more onions. So for those of you that missed our onion harvest, let me give you an overview of our onions this year. I am so incredibly happy with our onions this year. We had quite a few things that didn't grow great this year, but the onions were not one of those things. They are the best onions I think that I have ever grown. So let's grab this one because that's not gonna store very well. I'm just gonna grab some of the bigger onions here because they don't store quite as well as the smaller ones do. And I think that'll probably do us. We have 15 or 16 already chopped and frying up at the house right now. So we'll just leave the door open so it doesn't cook the onions in there. Also planning on making some horseradish sauce with the horseradish root that we picked the day before yesterday. I also have a bunch of tomatoes that I wanna get into my roaster oven, which came in the mail the other day, thank goodness. Came in the nick of time. 
Over here, I have a whole bunch of onions that one of my kids chopped up for me and Dan helped to get all fried up. Those we're gonna use for the French onion soup, of course. And then for dinner tonight, I'm going to be making pulled pork. I decided to take two roasts out and I'm gonna cook these at the same time. And one of them I'm actually going to can. So what I have set up over here to make that easy. So I have my smaller roaster oven over here and I'm gonna be putting my roasts in this one. And then in the larger one over here, we're going to put all the tomatoes that we picked out of the high tunnel. My plan with those tomatoes is to turn them into some more pizza sauce because I don't have enough pizza sauce in the pantry right now. I have all the tomatoes sitting in the sink to wash up and then I'm just gonna core these and chop them up and throw them straight into the roaster oven. And I wanted to show you something that came in the mail. All of my seed garlic from Raysa Farms and I wanted to show you what I bought. I'm really excited about these. Uh, several of these I have grown before, but some of them are new, <clears throat> excuse me, are new to me. I am not gonna be planting my garlic for another couple of weeks, so I want to open up all these bags so no moisture gets locked in here and I'm gonna put them down in my pantry where it's cool and dry and out of bright light. So these ones are Inchelium is the name of these. Look at how beautiful that is. And we have Chestnut Red, I have grown these ones before. Isn't that pretty? So beautiful. We have Northern Quebec, so this is a new one for me. And it is a smaller garlic, but it's supposed to grow really well in the north, hence its name. Purple Russian, so the Purple Russian are the ones that I always grow and they have nice gigantic bulbs. This is from my seed garlic. And we've got Music. Music is a garlic that I have been wanting to grow for a long time, but every time I go to do an order, they're always sold out. But uh, this year I set a timer for the day that they open sales <laughs> so that I could get some. So we have music here. What else do we have in our bag of goodies? And we have Rocky Red. Look at that. Isn't that stunning? How beautiful. And three more here. This one's Creme de la Ressa. So this is one that was developed by the farm that I grew these from. And these are just Beautiful, I ordered quite a few of these. So when we're gonna plant these, if you're not familiar, usually you plant your garlic in the fall, although I have done it in very early spring before and still actually got some decent sized bulbs. Nowhere near as big as you will if you start them in the fall. For us, like I said, it's usually the first week, second week of October before the ground really starts freezing because you do want them to start developing some roots before the freeze comes. And then we're gonna open this up and pull each of these cloves off. And then each one of these cloves will be planted in the ground just below the surface. And then I'll mulch them really heavily. Usually I like to use leaf mulch for mulching my garlic. And then once those start coming up in the spring, I'll pull that mulch back and then grow out my garlic. This one, this creme de la Ressa, is the one I'm most excited about. Although this one, I grew a couple years ago. This one's Susan Delafield. And it grew the hugest bulbs I have ever seen. They didn't have any large ones to buy. These ones were the small ones that they had for sale. But the bulbs that these grew were like this big <laughs> when I grew them a couple years ago. Last year I did all of my own seed, or I guess for this year, all of my own seed. So I didn't actually end up, maybe I did order a couple. I don't think so, I think I did mostly my own. And then this one is Georgia Crystal. It's another music variety. At least I think it is. I'm no expert in growing garlic. I've only been doing it for a couple of years. And this one is Talon. Another beautiful red looking one. So I'm just gonna leave all of these bags open. 
And like I said, these ones are from Raysa Creek Farm and they are fantastic. They have really great customer service as well. So those are gonna go down to the pantry until we plant them out. And I'll bring you along with planting, of course. Um, what are we gonna do now? We are going to get our roasts ready for the roaster oven and get those put in there. Then I think we'll get the tomatoes done. Okay, scratch that, <laughs> I've changed my mind. I am going to get the broth strained. I'm going to add some thyme, some salt, some pepper, a little bit of Worcestershire sauce to that and get that going on the stove so it's nice and hot when it comes time to actually can it. And then we'll get on to the roast and the tomatoes. still so much excellent bone marrow left in these bones you can see here so I actually think that I'm going to give these a second boil for another eight hours and see if I can't get a second batch of broth out of these same bones we're actually going to be butchering another steer probably in the next week here so I will have more yet to work with for some just plain broth, which I do want to can up as well. We are going to add a bit of salt to this. Some Worcestershire sauce. And I'm gonna do a little bit of fat skimming off of here because this cooked all night. And like I was talking about yesterday, if you leave your broth in the fridge overnight, it's really easy to skim the fat off because it solidifies. And I did not do that, so I am going to do my best to get as much of it off as I can. And actually, I'll show you how the fat looks that I took off yesterday that we're gonna use for frying. Okay, I think that should be sufficient. So this is what the tallow looks like from yesterday. So this is perfectly good for frying, but not great for making something like salves or a face cream or anything like that or a body butter because it was um, cooked or extracted from the bones and the marrow and the meat and all of that. So it's going to have a meaty flavor to it, unlike the fat that you may get when you butcher an animal and you take just the fat itself and cut off all the hunks of meat and all of that. That's generally the way tallow is made. I will probably be making tallow uh, this year, but not for at least until all of this main harvesting is done and then we'll get into making some fun projects like that. So I'm just gonna give this a little taste and see if there's anything else that we need to add to it. That's good. That actually doesn't need anything except for the time. It definitely needs some time. I put the entire sprig right in here and I'm gonna boil this up for around 20 minutes and then pull that out. Normally with canning, you want to use dried herbs because fresh herbs can taste kind of bitter um, in canning. So I'll be pulling that out in a little bit. Now we're gonna move on to seasoning our roasts and onto this we are going to season it with a whole bunch of paprika whole bunch pepper salt and then we're gonna rub this all in And then once this has cooked down a whole bunch, I'm gonna throw a bunch of onions in there and then I'm going to use all of the juice and those onions to make the barbecue sauce 
that we'll mix in with the pork when we can shred it and pull it all apart. It's delicious. So I think what I'm gonna do, because my breakers cannot handle both of those roaster ovens running over there at once, is I'm gonna bring my small one and put my small one over here and keep the big one over on the cook stove. And I put a little bit of water in the bottom part in here on this because that does help to not um, end up burning the inside of your roaster pan and I have actually ruined several <laughs> roasters that way by not doing that. I'm just going to fill this up with water so this has all my bones in it and um, get that going on the stove right away and I'm going to add a whole bunch of other stuff to this because these bones have already been boiling for a long time they're not going to have as much flavor and nutrients is them in them as this first batch. So I'm gonna throw a bunch of onions, carrots, a whole bunch of celery, probably a, some herbs and things into this as well. Tomatoes are gonna to be up next. I really find that it is helpful when I have a ton of things going on in the kitchen, as I do today, to try to get all the prep work done for all of the different projects first before I get into starting to put all of putting everything together. Otherwise it can get really overwhelming. The other thing that that allows for is cleaning up of the kitchen in between. Um, and again, also that can help to keep things a little bit less overwhelming. I still have a couple more garlic to peel and then I need to get all of these chopped up and fried because I do want to add this into our French onion soup. I think I'm gonna actually just pop these into the food processor. Pretty well done. So I'm actually gonna throw this right into our broth. But we'll finish off our tomatoes over here. Look at that pretty tomato. Now we're gonna start putting together our French onion soup. Oh, no, we're not. We're gonna clean this mess up first. Out to the pigs. So just to give you an idea of the amount of onions you need for this, this is 20 large onions that have been chopped here. And we did try using the food processor to do these, but it made them a little bit too mushy. So they're much nicer if you cut them by hand. And I'm just dividing up what we have here with these or in these jars. we're going to end up with exactly the right amount here. I'm gonna wash the rims on my jars in just a second, but I'm gonna get my canners going over here. And I'm gonna put about two to three inches of water in the bottom of each of these. Ends up being around a gallon of water. Okay, we have our canners going. So I'm gonna let these vent out of these little vent pipes here. These are all American canners for 10 minutes. 
and um, I'll show you when we're all finished. But in the meantime, while these are canning, we are going to get our horseradish done. It's super easy. One of the things about horseradish is that the fumes when you're working with it can irritate your lungs and your eyes. So just be careful with them. I am going to peel these horseradish and then we're gonna blend them up in our food processor. This is what horseradish looks like when it's peeled. So horseradish sauce, just a simple base that I'm gonna be making right now. Super simple. Vinegar, a little bit of sugar, a little bit of salt, and a little bit of water. And then when we're going to actually use it, we can add some sour cream, some mayonnaise to make it creamy. Uh, but this will last in the fridge for at least a month, if not longer the vinegar helps to preserve it. If you read about working with horseradish, uh, some people will say that you need to work with it outdoors because of the fumes, especially when you put it in your food processor. I personally haven't found that to be a big issue. I just make sure that the lid's on and then step away while it's mixing up, open it up without my face right directly over top of it. And then I wear eye protection, as you know, even when I'm chopping leeks <laughs> because my eyes are super sensitive to hot stuff. So we're gonna plunk this right into our food processor. If you're not wearing gloves when you cut up things like this, make sure you wash your hands really well so you don't accidentally touch your eyes with your hands. And I'm gonna add a couple tablespoons of vinegar to this and I think I'm going to go with white wine vinegar. A little bit of sugar and we're just going to mix this up and add a little bit of water to it until it's the consistency we want. There we go, that easy. So I'm gonna be taking this and putting it in a pint jar. And then that will go into the fridge. And when I wanna use it, I'll add a little bit of mayonnaise, a little sour cream, a little Dijon mustard, give it a mix up and it will be so good. So, so good. Probably salt and pepper too. We'll add to it, or not pepper, but salt. And there we go. Smells amazing, you guys. Smells so good. And we shall lit it up and put it in the fridge for the next time that we have some roast beef or beef tenderloin. And we only have 35 seconds left before we can put our weights on our canner. And this is for 75 minutes, I believe, for quarts. Let's just double check that. Yes, 75 minutes for quarts. So now I'm gonna clean up this colossal mess that I have developed in my kitchen. And I will be back with you in a bit to show you the finished French onion soup. See you soon. Okay, we have our jars out of the canner now, and I did lose one jar in the canner, which makes for some pretty yucky looking jars, especially pressure canning, I find this, because everything kind of cooks on. So these are gonna need a good wash before they go down to the pantry. We have our pork over here that is cooking up nicely and smells amazing. And the thing that actually smells the best in here right now are these tomatoes. Tomatoes just smell so good. And one of my kids just brought up some more tomatoes from the high tunnel, so I'm actually gonna chop these up and throw them right in with those ones that are already cooking. It's gonna take quite a while to cook these down, probably, I don't know, at least 12 hours or so before it's thick enough to make pizza sauce. But we will get to that in the next video. I hope that you enjoyed this one, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye.